Mike's here. Well, Mike, why don't you join in? We'll do some emails for what was it? This is Mike Mooneyham. He's the uh, uh, he's a sports writer with the Charleston Post Courier and a longtime wrestling columnist, and uh, actually did one of his best columns in a long time. I would recommend everyone check it out. It was a column on Scott Hall with interviews with from his wife. We quoted from it yesterday. Mike, how you doing today? Doing good, Dave. How are y'all? Oh, we're doing we're doing really good. Real quick, before we go on and do do a couple emails, yeah. I want you to give everyone is there an email address that they can click to to uh, get a copy of your Scott Hall column? Uh, sure. Um, I, they can uh, go to MikeMooneyham.com, and uh, I've got that article plus uh, a, a lot of other articles. Uh, we just opened up a website this week, as a matter of fact. Well, good for you. Yeah, and I've got a. Um, I'm starting to build it up. But anyway, that Scott Hall article that you were talking about uh, is is up and running. And of course, it'll probably be updated. <laughs> <before. laughs> <laughs> this is like the Scott Hall Daily Update. Um. Have you since we talked? Have, have you talked to anyone about uh, Scott Hall's arrest that didn't quite make this article? Um, yeah. Well, you know, he uh, he was uh, apparently arrested over the weekend uh, for kicking in a taxi driver's door. He tried to use his uh, his um, uh, credit card to pay for his tab and taxi driver said no and apparently got apparently he was uh, you know in his uh, usual inebriated state and started kicking in the uh, the door of the taxi and as far as I can pin it down I think it happened in Orange County there in Florida there was a report that it happened in New York um, but I'm pretty sure that's erroneous um, he there was talk as late as Friday night we actually talked about it on the show yeah. of uh, Scott Hall appearing on the ECW pay-per-view and I talked to Paul Heyman Yesterday, yeah. and he did say that they would not use Scott Hall now. And after the the arrest with the car wreck, he told me they would still use him. But this one, I guess, because of the pattern, because I, I was surprised he said that to me. He just goes, you know, hey, we can't we can't use him. Yeah, well, I, you know, I'm surprised they really went with Scott as far as they did because, um, you know, he's got some major problems that he needs to take care of, and I, I don't know how that's going to happen, but. It's certainly not going to happen by Kevin Nash and Page and all the other guys trying to 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 get the crowd stirred up and you know I mean I don't know what they want I guess maybe to satisfy the fans if they bring a dead corpse you know if they parade a corpse through the ring that'll satisfy them but you know he's got to be the uh, number one guy on the dead wrestlers pool right now. Oh God! And it's really morbid yeah. to talk about you know I mean I here's to a guy. Where you see the handwriting on the wall, and you know he's he's like a cat with nine lives. I mean, he's had at least nine lives at this point. How many? How many? Do you know how many car wrecks he's actually had? Well, he, he must be at least ten. He had five in '98. He had oh, five car wrecks in '98, and and uh, you know I think this is the first one since late '98. But that's six in in the span of two years. Boy, what? And I had a question because I know you covered this. Yeah. What? How did he get partial custody with his track record? That that is a question that is uh, I can't figure out. I mean, I don't know the the, the judicial system in in, uh, in Florida how that runs. I know it's in Seminole County. I know they're having a hard time with their book counting their votes. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, I mean, it, it's a mystery to me. You know, from from and I haven't been covering it pretty close from. From what I understand, that the judge is not up on the on the case, and the judge isn't even aware. And there have been a couple of changes in lawyers too. Um, so you know they'll come into the case, and they won't have all their documentation. And um, and basically, um, you know, Scott will come in looking, you know, you know, in pretty good shape, at least in in the courtroom. And um, yeah, it was real strange how we got the increased visitation rights just a month ago. You know, right. Right after he was arrested in that same courtroom and taken off to jail in handcuffs. Oh, well, the, the, with the uh, probation violation deal. Yeah, the, the day before that hearing. Now, uh, how, does, how does this work? Okay, he's been on probation for a while. Then he violated his probation by not doing the community service. Yeah, and, and then he, like the, he, he, he had started he had started doing his uh, community service, and what that was was uh, some members of his church um, had gotten together and. Decided that he could, you know, clean some pool chairs and stuff like that. You know, not really heavy, heavy work, and uh, apparently couldn't even fulfill those commitments. You know, he started maybe for a couple of days and then he just didn't do it anymore. And 
and two years later they found out that his uh, his uh, sentence was uh, not filled. And the day before the hearing, you know, it was brought up in court. The cops came in with the warrant and took him out in handcuffs. And now the very next week in that same courtroom, he gets uh, increased visitation rights. So. But then, okay, so then, you know, this was what was really strange to me, is a guy on probation then gets arrested for the DUI. I mean, like, what what is considered revoking your probation? If you're if you're not fulfilling the terms, which is very minor, you know, all, all things considered. But then the DUI, you know, I mean, it's like, you know, I mean, I mean, it's not even a, a first offense. No. You know what I mean? Oh, I know. Well, I think at this point what he will do, he, he will definitely uh, lose those rights, unsupervised rights anyway. Yeah. Um, you know, I know if it were my kids, I would feel pretty bad whether it be, you know, uh, I, I would feel pretty bad putting the, the care of uh, safety of my kids over to a spouse, you know, who's got that kind of track record. I mean, you know, you figure when he got in that wreck a couple of weeks ago, he was supposed to pick up his children um, at a McDonald's. See, they have to, he and his uh, wife have to meet at a, a neutral site whenever they exchange children. And uh, apparently he might have had a little bit of sense as he got near that McDonald's because he passed the McDonald's and decided not to turn around because uh, he allegedly was in a pretty inebriated state at that time. He had been up drinking all night. Um, and, you know, his blood level, when they took it three and a half, three hours after the accident, it was still about three to three and a half times above the legal limit. So, you know, they found him with containers, so apparently he had been drinking heavily the night before and had continued drinking that morning. Uh, but fortunately, he didn't have the kids. You know, he didn't pick the kids up because, um, you know, they would have been in the car. And who knows what would have happened. And, and it's very dangerous for people who are on the road right now, you know, when Scott Hall's around. I mean, I, I know I wouldn't want to be on the other side of the street with him coming my way. You know, one of the, one of the things I think that's really sad, because, because I mean, I, I, I know a lot of people who are very close to Scott Hall. And, you know, some of them... You know, the attitude's pretty similar. It's kind of like they don't know what to do. Uh, they, you know, they're not so anxious for him to come back to WCW. I don't know too many that actually think it's the right thing. I don't know, I'm don't. i not so sure that this whole gimmick is not just a way for those guys that are there to, to kind of get over with the crowd as much as actually thinking him coming back would be the best thing for him. Yeah. But he really does love his kids. And I just think, that, like, whatever it is that he worked so hard... Whether it, whether it was a good or a bad court decision, he worked so hard to get that visitation, and then to blow it, you know, like just a couple of weeks later, uh, I mean, again, it, it just really shows the depth of the problems. Oh, it does. This it, guy's got real problems. It does. It's a serious problem, and, and, and at this stage of the game, I think the only way he's going to get over this problem is to go into some heavy-duty rehab, you know, not one where uh, he leaves at the end of the day and, and takes a, tax, a taxi cab to the bar. Yeah. You know, that just isn't going to cut it anymore. He's going to have to be isolated, and it's going to have to be long-term. And, uh, you know, that's the only way. He's got a, a very severe addiction. And, you know, it, it's psychological problems, too. The whole family has been through through quite a bit, you know, the last uh, ten years. And, yeah. um, you know, you really got to wonder where is it going to end, who's going to intervene. Uh, Scott is, uh, you know, I don't think he, it, it, it's, uh, within his power right now to do it by himself, you know. And if these friends, if Kevin is a good friend of his, which supposedly is, the best thing he can do is, is talk to Scott and say, look, buddy, you know, we we got to do something now, you know, for your own good, for the good of your and, kids. You know, we want to see you around here for a while. Yeah, they really need to, to get that done now because, I mean, like, let's face it, we've had more warning signals on this one than anyone. I mean, even oh, yeah. Pillman, even Pillman and a lot of people, including myself, saw the warning signals in Pillman. They weren't as loud and clear as this one, and it can easily end up the same way. And then the, the other thing is, and, 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 I, and I hope, like, I mean, I know most of the people who are listening to the show understand this, but and I wish people, you know, who don't listen would understand. The worst thing this guy could do right now is to be hired back and go back on the road in a wrestling environment where everyone else is doing the stuff that he can't do. Yeah. Uh, because if he does it, he'll end up, you know, yeah, that, he'll end up dead. Yeah, I wouldn't and, even and, 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 about it. Yeah, I mean, it, it'd be the... I mean, I'm not talking about, and, I, and I, I, I fear, and I hope I'm wrong about this, I fear that if Eric Bischoff buys WCW, uh, that, you know, he'll recognize 
the pop that you can get bringing Scott Hall back, and there's no question that you can for a couple of weeks, uh, that he might do that, and I I hope he doesn't. I hope strongly that he doesn't, even, even though it'll help, it'll yeah, help I his ratings the first week yeah. and all that. Yeah, and I, I talked to Eric about that myself uh, a few months ago, and you know, I, this was right before Eric left, and uh, yeah, he understood the severity of the problem, and he said, you know, under no conditions would he want Scott back okay. uh, right now unless Scott was a hundred percent well. He understands the, the depth of the situation, so okay, you know, but of course Eric has said other things too, so yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I do know that when I, I talked to Eric, and this would have been in February, about Scott, and he was really concerned about Scott at that yeah. time because that's when Scott had a bunch of problems yeah. as well. And, uh, you know, he under he understood the problems, and he, you know, he wasn't, like, turning, you know, like, just going, like, yeah. oh, you know, like, I, I hope we can get him back. I mean, he was, he was worried about him personally at the time. Yeah, well, I think a lot of folks are now, and it's, um, you know, it's a pretty serious situation, and I uh, certainly don't want to make light of it, but... Um you know, something's got to be done, and I just don't think that, you know, I, I think Scott really um, believes that he can come back to wrestling now, that some way if he were to hook up with ECW, um, you know, he's going to get another serious look. And I think before he tries to even get back in a wrestling ring, he needs to take care of himself and, and do what he needs to do, and, that, and that's very obvious. Anyone well, on that Rodman pay-per-view by right? Um, no, I don't we have any now. Role for that show. Uh, it'd been too scary. For it didn't see the show. Yeah, well, we get 69 percent for the last uh, WCW and the last ECW, so uh, I don't know. But um, actually, I I'll try to check on that. Let me put it down. Uh, check on the Rodman buy rate. Um, did they say they'd be happy with a point one zero? Yeah, well, they said they wanted to do what WCW did for Mayhem, which wasn't very so good. Point one zero. Yeah, they, if they can get a point one zero, they should be happy. I don't know that they can get that for a tape show. I mean, that was a Heroes of Wrestling one was the point one zero, and obviously they didn't come close to that either. And I, I sensed from reaction, we got far more reaction to Heroes of Wrestling pay per view than we did for the Rodman pay per view, probably three times as much, really. So it's not good. It's not good. Um, Mike, what are your thoughts as far as celebrity involvement in wrestling today? I think it's just been overdone, and no one's going to get up for it. Yeah, I think that's a that's um, something that's been uh, you know nobody really cares anymore. That uh, novelty wore off a long time ago. Yeah, and I, mean, I certainly you know, didn't enjoy the last few. Yeah, I mean Vince McMahon did make WrestleMania with celebrities. If you go back, you know, in '85, especially. Oh yeah, at the time it was cutting edge. Yeah, I mean that, yeah. that really put him on the map. But now I think you know, I think people would, uh, I think I think the celebrities are in the ring right now when you've got Rock cutting a promo like he did Monday night. Yeah. You can't get much better than that. Yeah, back then yeah, the celebrities were just considered so much bigger than the wrestlers. Yeah, much bigger right. stars. Right. That's why I was a little disappointed in the Goldberg book. You know, when he was, uh, you know, they had. Oh, okay, so so hero worshipy. Yeah, yeah, I, and you know, I, I just think that, uh, you know, uh, he should have been portrayed, you know, larger than life. And, uh, how's 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 Rick, how's Rick Flair's book going? Or do you even know? Um, no, I don't. Oh, okay. I don't think it is going. Oh, okay. I, I talked to the, the original author, and then I heard that he wasn't the author anymore afterwards. That's true. Yeah. Uh, let's see. This is from Simon Checkett, who goes, I was wondering how you would feel, this is me, if the big show came back to WFTV and he brought Brian's name up in an interview. Um, I really would, I would personally enjoy it, but I will tell you that it will never happen because things like that don't happen on WFTV because they would, they would tell him beforehand, why are you doing something that no one's going to understand? You know, as opposed to on WCW, where he probably would do it. Yeah, if you return to WCW, there'd be the... Uh... <laughs> Remember that time Hogan burned the Observer? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was going to actually bring that up. That um, was a great day. That was so funny. I'm watching this, and I'm going like, I can't believe he's doing that. You know what, I I shouldn't say I did it wrong, because I just kind of ignored it. But it's like, Wade Keller used that for advertising purposes for years afterwards. That you know they burned the torch, and it's actually the Observer that they burned. But whatever. Um, I mean, he, I think he meant all all of those all newsletters generically anyway. Because but but it wasn't. He just goes observe this, throws it in the bonfire. Him Sting and Savage. The, the funniest thing about that was that um, they, he just goes. We worked all the boys. Randy Savage really doesn't have a torn tricep. And then the finish of the match that Randy Savage had with Lex Luger was a submission because of the injury to his torn tricep. 
and he had one arm that was like half the size of the other. You know, and it was like he was trying to go, you know, because because we reported that Randy turned towards tricep, which he did. And he's just going like, we worked all the boys and got it in the dirt sheets. His arm is fine. Ha, 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 you're all fooled. And then he comes out there and his arm's out the size of the other. And he, and they use it, but they used it for the finish that night. I was just like, Brian, do you remember all that, Brian? Do you remember I that, do Brian? remember that. Yeah. I'm watching this going I like. I saw the bonfire. It was like on the pre-show or something like that. No, no, it was, it was like the first five minutes of the regular show. Okay, I missed that. I, I must have shown up later or something because I never saw the actual bonfire. But yeah, I they, saw the rest of the pay-per-view. When they threw the thing in. So when they do that, I was thinking, like, now, he did, the one arm is half the size of the other, so I know he hurt the arm, okay? But, you know, I guess they could work people and say it's not hurt, and they won't notice that one arm's so much smaller than the other. But then when Luger beats Savage with, like, an armbar submission, and they play off the arm injury in the finish, and he's just told everyone there's no injury, that's when I realized that they had completely lost their mind. Uh, let's see. This is on Tuesday show. You mentioned all Japan peaking around 1995. Outside of the 16 minute draw with Kobashi and Kawada, what matches from that era top Kobashi and Misawa from 97 and 98, or the Misawa Kawada matches uh, afterwards? All those matches, every t almost every major singles match. There are exceptions, but most of them with Misawa Kawada Kobashi in any form against each other uh, were phenomenal. Those were the state of the art guys in that era. It was like you know, like Flair and Steamboat in the era before, and I mean, the one thing about Flair and Steamboat is, is that there's, for whatever reason, I guess because the personality of the matches and they were in different cities, people remember the matches. Yep. Whereas, like, Misawa and Kobashi, all those men, to me, having seen all of them, they all run together because they were all equally great, and they were almost all at either Budokan Hall or in Osaka, so you don't have that differentiation. I don't know. And they were they're just, but they were all awesome, or almost all awesome. This has from Adam, who goes, I don't know if you're aware of this, but there's an Internet campaign trying to get Juventud Guerrera into the WWF. To join this campaign, you send an email to WF fans at WF.com with the subject WF Juice Campaign. It seems like a good idea to me because the juice deserves to be in the spotlight once again. That's um, just going to do nothing but annoy the people that have to check those emails. Yeah, I would not. Here, here's the thing. With, with, with First of all, I would be really surprised if the WF would take Hooven to Guerrero right now. Now, down the road, possibly. He's super talent, okay? But, you know... Again, it, you know, you can't turn a blind eye to everything. You know, and Hubert Guerrero is my friend, and 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 for him, from his perspective, and I don't think that he might even want to hear this, but we'll talk. Well, we will talk about this. I think the WWF will not use him correctly. They never use anyone small correctly. I think his best bet is to wait it out. WCW will take him back if enough time goes by and his head's on straight. I mean, because there's no problem with his attitude. Really, I mean, you know, you know, and, and and everyone, everyone knows his talents, and you can never have, you know, enough good talent in the undercard, and they don't. And I don't think anyone wanted to fire him. I think they felt, I think the company felt they were forced into that move. And I think that if he was okay, they would bring him back. And of course, if that company's dying, WWF may be the only place to go it's for him to make money. And but I, the thing is, is you know, I see like, um, you know, Taka Michinoku is the perfect example, and it just scares me for him to go there. And just be like, you know, some joke that's on Sunday Night Heat that gets, you know, that never gets any kind of a push. Cause he's Especially because he's funny. I know. They're going to take that, advantage of that before they're going to take advantage of him in the ring. But but his, his humor, the humor isn't making them look like a goof. Mm -hmm. That's why I'd really, I mean, for money, I'd like to see him make money. I'd like to see him go there, and I'd like to see him get a push. But I don't think that if he went there, and they just don't have that mentality to push a guy like that. No matter how talented. Uh, let's see. This is uh, okay. Um, well, this we got a whole bunch of stuff on the Starcades. Let me just see if I can find the, the definitive one. Okay, here we go. Starcade 1996 is released on video as Starcade 1997. Okay. Starcade 97 is released on video as Starcade 1998. In 1998, Starcade 98 is released simply as Starcade. So anyway, that's that's the deal with the video boxes. So Starcade ninety nine would be Starcade ninety nine. Yeah, I think they probably caught up on that. Except nobody wanted to buy Starcade ninety nine by then. <laughs> what a so, scheme. Yeah. Uh, let's see. This is from Joe, who goes, when WCW was hot, they had this bad habit of going to commercials between matches. I can never understand why they couldn't plan the commercial breaks around the matches. Oh no 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 no! Those were planned. <laughs> was this just bad planning on their part? No, it was it was a strategic part. 
of their plan. I remember Tony Schiavone always saying the tape machines are rolling, and it really killed the excitement of a well-worked match. Boy, I remember that, too. Um, it was just, I think that their feeling was that if a match was in the ring during a break, you were less apt to switch channels um, to go to the other show. I don't it was know if usually that's... a pretty good match, too, when they were going to breaks and going to the back for a Hogan promo or whatever. They used to remember all those times they would have like Dean Malenko wrestling Chris Benoit, oh, yeah. and they would go to the back for Hogan's limo to come in yeah, while those right. guys are out there. Right, oh. those live shows, yeah. You know, oh man! One also was um, it was a Thunder match. It was Benoit versus Canyon, and like the whole psychology of the match, the entire time they were working up to Benoit hitting with a chop, because yeah. Canyon just kept avoiding it for like you know the first five six minutes. So finally, Canyon misses this like handstand in the corner, and Benoit just gives him this thunderous chop. And at that point, he's just going to follow him around the ring and give him all these chops. And as soon as he gave him the first one, what do they do? They cut backstage to Jimmy Hart recruiting people for that hardcore. Remember that stupid hardcore junkyard battle yeah, royal? Yeah. Oh, and is that every the one that everyone the chops? The one, remember that battle royal where everyone got hurt? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it was so poorly lit. Those guys worked their ass off for this thing and that then, was... Like, ended his career pretty much. And we won he, the ended, he, just, he ended his career a couple oh, weeks I later. Oh, that, uh, that was another match. That's right. Yeah, oh, no, this one where... Um, Someone just got totally... Uh, ha Halloween got hurt really bad. Sandman got hurt really bad. Mm -hmm. Or Hack, as he was called then. Yeah. There were a bunch of guys that got hurt in that one. I mean, they, they were just, you know, taking Hurricane Ranas on hoods and stuff, and the lighting was so bad you couldn't even appreciate them. Yep, that was so horrible. Speaking of which, any canyon sightings of light? No. <laughs> He's vanished. Oh. They could always use a guy like that. <laughs> hopefully, so. hopefully he'll come back. Uh, let's go to Mark in New Hampshire. Mark, what's going on? Hey, Dave. Hey, how are you? Hey, how you doing, man? Hey, um, how much has the WWF business off um, the last few months? In what in what uh, category? I mean, TV the ratings are TV ratings are down depending on the show, anywhere from like maybe twelve to seventeen percent. Uh, heat heat down the most. Of all of them. Is it usually down this time of the year, or is it usually up? Uh, no, um, there's actually, except for Raw, which gets hurt a little bit by football, um, these other the other shows usually are not affected by the time of the year. Like, in this time of the year, is actually a better time of the year for, for a lot of the other shows. See, I think, if you look back at WCW, they went downhill when they were running Monday and Thursday night when they started the Thunder. And now mm -hmm. I think SmackDown is starting to take away from Raw. I oh, think, I, no question. I mean, no, no quite. I, I think there's too much. There's too much TV. You, it doesn't matter who's running the promotion. If you oversaturate it, you're gonna you're gonna kill it. And WCW had a real good product before they went to two shows a week, and then suddenly it was just you just saw it over and over again. And I don't think that uh, the WWF the, can be that much different. The only difference is the WWF does have a better product. I mean, WCW. It it wasn't when they still did real big business when Thunder started for a yeah. couple of months. But then when the shows got terrible, you know, that, the, having the two shows sped the decline up, I would agree. And I think the same thing, same thing will happen in WWF is that if WWF gets boring, the fact that they got two shows will make that decline go quicker. Oh, de well, I think it's already happening because if you're, if you're down 17%, it's, you know, people else should be inside watching TV this time of the year. I don't think that's a good sign at all. And I, I'll tell you, I think they've run through most of the combinations that they have. Uh, look at look at the main event for the next pay per view. They're basically just throwing in all the guys that they've been recycling over and over again. Um, I, I, I see it going downhill pretty rapidly here. I got a, I got a question that just reminds me. If Hunter and Rikishi were together um, a year ago with that act, with that uh, drive by deal with Steve Austin, right? How come they feuded so much? Not not a lot, but they they feuded a little bit during the year. That's oh, anyway. You want know the real it. answer? Or? Oh, I know the real answer. The real answer is they hadn't come up with that. <laughs> but anyway, um. <laughs> so Dave, I no, just, I, I think the I, WWF, you know, they've gotten, they've had a pretty good run of it here because WCW has been so bad and it has been bad. But I, I think, think the that, problem is like when the uh, product starts getting bad and they have to start hot shotting. If you only have one show a week and you start doing some hot shotting, it does damage. But when you have two shows, it does the damage twice as fast. That's right. It goes down mm -hmm. the drain twice as fast. It wouldn't take much. I mean, WCW was unstoppable just before they started Thunder, and like Dave said, into Thunder, maybe the first six months. But it, it fell apart really quick after that because you've just seen the thing over and over so much. Hey, Dave, what's going on with ECW? Is, are they, how, how bad is the situation there? 
I mean, it's bad enough that the guys are, are, are late on pay. They should have done pretty well. They had a big gate on Sunday, so that's good. Um, they're, they've only got uh, they've got the two shows left this month. They've got the New York on the 15th and Philadelphia on the 23rd. Then they got three shows booked in January, and you know everyone was given the opportunity to get a release. To the best of my knowledge, no one's no one's taken Paul Heyman up on that offer. If it was any other if it was any other time period in wrestling, all these guys would be gone. But they got so many of these guys got nowhere to go. They got I mean, nowhere to go. So a lot of a lot of maybe saying, I mean I could see I mean look at Van Damme you know it's like everyone talks about like what a great star he is but I don't know where he would where he could go I yeah. guess he could go to WCW but he did, you know that well, he that's really lost almost, there you know you're right and, and you know that, that's that's so well, sad you say that they'd get the rock would, lock look what happened to Mike Awesome yeah I yeah mean, hey hey Dave is that the worst gimmick in the history of wrestling seventy seconds no but it's <laughs> no it's not the worst but no but, great guy um, he's got talent though. Oh, but it's it's a sad one because he could be a main eventer and and he yeah you're right but I don't know Mike what do you think worst gimmick ever? Uh, well, probably the most damaging for a wrestler was Terry Taylor's. Yeah, because yeah, because he never he never could get over it. Ended his career. Yeah, hopefully this won't be like that. But Mike Awesome is more talented. I don't know if you can say, but as far as what today's wrestling wants, uh, Mike Awesome is better than. Well, Terry Taylor wouldn't work at all today, would he? Um, he was really talented. Don't you know? You know, if, if he got a push, he was a great heel. He had a lot of charisma uh, too. You know, I mean, people look at Terry Taylor today and think, you know, think more of him as a, you know, a Booker and and things like that. But um, he was he was pretty charismatic back in his day. And he was he was an excellent worker. He was like one of those guys that all the girls liked. Yeah. He had a lot going for him until until his career was destroyed with that gimmick. <laughs> yeah, and I think the only reason he did it is his wife was pregnant, and you know he really needed the job. And, you know, he made he, he made he made more money as the Red Rooster than he ever made in his entire career. But it, it's like the perfect it's like the perfect analogy of of short term gain and long term disaster. Yeah. If he had never taken that gimmick, you know he could have. Terry Taylor was as good as Bret Hart. I mean, I always use those analogies. He was. That, he was you know, an excellent worker. They were. They were. Terry Taylor and Bret Hart were equal size and equal ability at the same time. And Terry Taylor got the gimmick, and then, and then Bret Hart didn't. <laughs> the Red Rooster. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Dave, Whose idea was that? It had to be Vince's idea. It was Vince's. Dave, yeah. Dave, what, Dave what are the odds of uh, Bischoff buying the ECW with um, that group he's got? What would you say if you had to bet on it? Mm, like zero percent. Oh, you don't think he will? No. Oh, you think that's so? That whole thing that's been going on the last week, you don't believe it? No, WCW. Oh, WCW. No, WCW. Oh, you said ECW. WCW. Oh, I think uh, I don't want to put odds on it, but you know, I mean, I would say I I would guess right now better than fifty percent. You do? Oh yeah, I would say better than. And, I think I think the only holdup is if WCW if WCW is willing to sell to him. That's that's where the holdup is. Do you think he'd run it right into the ground with like Hogan and Savage and all that crap? I hope not. For the good of everyone, I hope not. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, I you know everything logically tells me it's not going to work. I just hope I'm wrong on that one because wrestling think, badly think, needs something good. Do you think he ever had a clue what he was doing, or did he get lucky with Hogan with uh, Nash in the hall? He's a great salesman. He had a clue, but ultimately get that lucky. Big but he job. was he, he he did get lucky though. Yeah, he got lucky, so, but I wouldn't consider it like just total. Like that's the only reason that it got okay. as big as it did was just total luck. Um, let's see. Uh, any, anything, Brian? Real quick, anything quick on um, as far as uh, Figure Four this week you want to talk about? Uh, just a bunch of stuff on ECW problems there. Uh, the pay per view rundown, rundown of the uh, UK Rebellion pay per view, and actually we have a uh, whole preview up at WrestlingObserver.com as well as one week, uh, actually one year ago in Figure 4, which we'll be putting up there every Wednesday so you can take a look at an entire issue from a year ago, see what was going on, sample it, and that sort of thing. Okay, cool. So a lot of stuff on WrestlingObserver.com, also information on getting a subscription to The Observer. Um, also, we, we were talking about this yesterday, Phil from uh, D.C. Uh, the top 200 matches, the website is www.deathvalleydriver.com, uh, best of the 90s. So anyway, I should actually check that out. I'm going to save that for myself and look at some of those things. Uh, this is from Chris, who says, 
I don't know what it says on the box for the Piper versus Hogan Starcade match, but I know what it should say. Warning. Do not operate heavy machinery or drive a motor vehicle after watching this match. May cause drowsiness. Drinking alcohol may intensify the effect of this match. Then again, drinking alcohol during the match may actually make the match enjoyable, so go for it. If you don't drink during the match, you may want to drink after the match in hopes that you won't remember the match the next morning. But since you're renting this video to see this match, chances are you've been drinking the last few hours anyway. <laughs> that was the Starcade match? <laughs> the Starcade match with Hogan and Piper. Actually, they should... That, that, the, um, it was the cage match that was the real bad one, wasn't it? Well, they I had a lot of the cage match was like hideous, and there was the cage was like uh, 100 it was feet a, tall. It was 100 feet high, and Randy Savage came off the top of it. With that flying as a double sledge or whatever, and I thought, that guy will not be walking ever again. And he did. That yeah, was a miracle. Yeah, I thought he was killing himself for sure. And that was when he already had that injury, too, right? I mean, his, his knee Didn't was he just come back from a knee injury? Because I remember watching him going like he's completely out of his I mind. Really he's not jumping. I was surprised when he did it, considering, yeah. Um, yeah. I heard an interview from, uh, I think Ben Miller on WrestleMania interviewed Piper, and Piper was talking about that match, and he agreed that it was a quite hideous match, and he claimed that he and Hulk Hogan did not know it would be in a cage. And <laughs> it was, he, he said the end of the ring. It was built as a cage match forever. And he went to the ring, and they got in the ring, and all of a sudden this cage started lowering. And they went, well, what the hell do we do now? And they just had this cage match. Yeah. <laughs> it's a great story. I was Randy Savage in backstage, and he would be jumping off this cage. <laughs> it's on the top ropes. <laughs> oh, God. I sent you that interview, but it is so long. It is like 100 pages long, it seems. Oh, really? Cause I, I need to get I, I, on the show, because it sounded like a hell of an interview. Well, I saw the interview he did on uh, Slam Wrestling, mm -hmm. and, I mean, it was tremendously entertaining. <laughs> um, Piper on the show. You know, there's been a lot of talk about that. I, I, don't, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know about Piper on the show. It would kind of be <laughs> like Dusty. No, it wouldn't, though. If a I thought it would, like would be like Dusty, if I thought it would be like Dusty, I, I, would, I, would, I would beg him to come on. Or close to begging to come on, but I don't think it, I don't think he'd be like Dusty. Really? But what do you, what do you no, talk about I'll, 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 talk, I'll talk to you. I'll talk to you about this one off, off the air. Okay. <laughs> but no, um, no, I need to know. Okay, but I when you know I've we, you know I've I've talked with him about doing the show, and he basically said, "You don't want the kind of heat you're going to get if I'm on your show." <laughs> <laughs> that was he goes, "I'm not doing your show for your own good." <laughs> <laughs> Uh, let's see. Uh, this is from Chris who goes, I've been listening to a lot of archived interviews from your show and the law. It's funny when you hear some things guys say. Like Mike Awesome in April said how much he loves it in ECW. It's one big happy family, and it's not about the money for him in wrestling. He ripped on WCW and said some very not nice things about guys like Sid and Luger. They probably deserved it. Um, he probably said those things now. Still. Yeah, just just not publicly. And it's always uh, about the money. Yeah. I think it's a good way for people to learn just how true it is that in wrestling things change every day, and how hard it's to believe how hard it is to believe almost anything that anyone ever says. Uh, also, when you hear rumors that at the time we're going around, so much never ends up happening. It's a good way of seeing how many net rumors go around that never materialize. Everyone should check out archived shows, not for that reason, but because they're great to learn from as well as very entertaining. So, let's go to Sean in Pennsylvania. Sean, what's up? Hey, how you doing? Really uh, good. I, uh, first, I have a question for Mike. Uh, as a journalist, how, you know, I, I know what it's like trying to, you know, push uh, wrestling down people's throats. How, how did you guys, uh, in a newspaper, how did you come about getting your column? How many arms did you have to put? Well, you know, most of the people in the building knew I was uh, pretty much involved in wrestling. And it, and it done a lot of articles. I was a sports editor there back in the uh, during part of the 80s, and, um, you know, I tried to sneak some wrestling stories uh, in the paper, and, uh, you know, they were very well received, and at that point, wrestling was pretty much accepted, you know, it was out of the closet, and it was uh, pretty much mainstream, this was after the big uh, WWF na national expansion, and, you know, it was almost sort of faddish, so um, I started, you know, the executive editor approached me about doing the column, and we were going to sort of do it on a trial basis, but it it took off so well, you know, it's sort of been a staple in our newspaper ever since. And, you know, a lot of other papers uh, run weekly columns now, but, uh, yeah. you know, this was also, uh, so it was, uh, it was a little, uh, some new territory. Yeah. yeah, I know it can be difficult because, you know, 
the sports community is so ingrained against, you know, oh, you know, yeah, it you doesn't know, belong and, and here because it's not a sport and then entertaining people. It can be like, well, it doesn't belong here. It's not necessarily yeah, entertaining. Yeah, well, you know, fortunately, some of these, uh, some of the media got out of the dark ages and uh, realized that, you know, millions of people were wrestling fans and, and uh, bought newspapers and could actually read. So, you know, that's when they started uh, having a little bit of a change in viewpoint. Yeah. Uh, also, real, real, real quick, um, um, I was at uh, Starcade, the, the Sting versus Hulk Hogan Starcade, and oh, I was yeah. at the Nitro following, and those two shows combined to resign me to never go to another <laughs> WCW show again. <laughs> and I think there are just way too many people like me who've just been, you know, like horribly burned by these horrible shows that they you know, went around the country and did, and, you know, I mean, they would need to build up so much goodwill, you know, with the fans again that, you know, I mean, I mean, even if Bischoff buys the company and, you know, even if he, you know, does something decent, I don't think it'll ever turn around. <laughs> and are we sure that Bischoff, yeah, are we sure Bischoff's going to be a change man at this point? I mean, you know, <laughs> he still no has way. absolutely no respect for this part of the country. You know, he'll come to oh, Charlotte. Gosh. He'll come into Charlotte and, uh, you know, uh, humiliate have player. player job. And even, you know, Bobby Eaton <laughs> have him job to a power plant guy in the opening match. Humiliate Arn Anderson. Yeah, and, and, and right with Arn. So, you know, he still doesn't get it because uh, the last time I talked to him, he still didn't understand what the big deal was about, you know, Barry and Flair and all those guys. And I said, well, you do it every, you know, you do it continuously in, in it, this it part had of the to, country. And he said, it had to be do a, it everywhere. It, it had to be a... But no, 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 no. It was always done worse in, like, Charlotte, Greensboro, sure. or Winston-Salem, Richmond. Always, you know. Sure it was. The other, the other thing on that is that, um, it, 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 I mean, it was almost like, because we, we used to joke about it so much, it had, it had to be, intentional. like, intentional in so, to some degree. It may not have been intentional by Bischoff, but, it, but somebody somewhere... <laughs> they had a plan yeah. of what they were going to do. Oh, it was too well well uh, conceived because, yeah. um, you know, by design, it, it couldn't have been any better. And, you know, a lot of people still don't understand it. I don't think Flair understands it completely of uh, what Bischoff or whoever, you know, what they have against him and why they don't want good business in this part of the country. I mean, I can understand if maybe they had, like, a Sunday show and a Monday show, both in the same general area, like around Charlotte. Yeah. And, like, Sunday he got beaten up, and right. then Monday on the show he Get came back yeah. and just beat up all the bad guys and won the world title. Well, payback, it never happens that way. It goes from bad to worse. Mm -hmm. You know, they'll beat him on Sunday, and Monday they'll slam a cage door and, on him and put him out of action. Or bury him in the desert. Or bury him in the desert, and he never finds <laughs> out what happened. Uh -oh. One other thing. Hey, did you, did you, did you ever get his watch back? No. <laughs> He never got anything back. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if he even ever got Asia back. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. He never. Do you? No, he, he never got anything back. I, I, he's, still waiting, you, though. he's still waiting. He's still waiting. He's just done so much for that company. It's a shame to see him treated that way. Well, you know, what do you think the biggest match WCW has right now? Ironically, Rick Flair and Scott Steiner, without any question. That's it. No question about it. That's their big money match. And let's see how they do it. Will they rush it? They won't even do it. <laughs> That's for Flair's best health, you know. I don't want to see Flair in there with Steiner because, you know. I mean, yeah, I don't know that I do. I don't know that I do either. But, you know, and then the other thing is is that to make it work, Steiner has to sell. You know, even if Steiner goes over at the end, he does have to sell 80% of the match to make it good because that's what people want to see the old guy, you know, um, get his revenge. Yeah, that's just the basic premise of this wrestling match here, you know. Yeah. Oh, one other thing, thing real quick before, I, before I get going. Get off. Um, the, the situation with ECW, I, I was reading the, an old issue of The Torch where Paul was talking about the deal he made on TNN, and I don't understand whether or not he was, not he was just desperate or what the situation was, but, I mean, it, it, I got the impression from reading that interview that perhaps he, you know, going to, the, the, to that detail of the business side of the business maybe wasn't his forte and he should have, you know, stuck an intermediary to negotiate those kinds of deals because that, I mean, unless he was just really desperate, in that case I can understand him, you know, needing the cash to just do it, but I mean, 
to for him to promise them pay per view and you know all this additional money. That I mean, the the whole nature of the television business is that you know people pay you to provide programming. You know, <laughs> it's not where you pay them for to be on. Well, they they weren't they weren't paying TNN. For for the for the time they had a they had a, a a very detailed deal worked out that they thought was in their best interest and you I mean, know TNN in that interview the thing was like you know they got profits uh, all the additional money from like, well, well the whole the whole the whole the way the deal was supposed to be working was is that TNN would put them on and that TNN would get a percentage of whatever business increase ECW got you know like if their house shows went up if their pay per view went up. If their advertising went up, they would share in the additional profits. That was like the way it was put together. Um, and you know, TNN lost their interest in ECW for whatever reason, real quick. You got to remember, TNN put ECW on on the station under the guise that they were going to do a weekly 2.0 rating, which in hindsight was foolish on everyone's account, but that's what they thought. And then when they opened up at 09, and they never really moved from there. Um, they lost interest, and then they started, you know, they started negotiating with, with WWF. And but also, you got to remember, but before Paul Heyman got the ECW deal on TNN, he was bouncing checks, and 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 they were, I mean, if they didn't get that deal, they would have probably gone out of business that year too. I mean, the thing, you know, gave them hope, it prolonged the thing, but ultimately, you know, the deal in the long run, you know, hurt the company too because just on many levels, it hurt the company. Well, I mean, is there a better deal for them out there to be had? I mean, if there was, wouldn't he have got it by now? <laughs> I, I, I mean, I mean, the thing is, it's not TV. He could, I, I, I think he could probably get weak TV. But what good is that? He needs, he needs TV that will allow him to be profitable. If he can't be profitable, and that means TV that pays him basically. If he can't be profitable, um, I mean, he's already so deep. You know, they're already deep in debt, and I mean, he's got to, you know, he's going to hold on until he can make that deal. And if he can't make that deal. Either something's going to come along or something's not going to come along. I don't know. Uh, you know. All right. Well, thanks a lot. Let's get to the phone calls because we've got Wade in Minnesota. Is this the famous Wade in Minnesota? Yeah, this show reminds me of an old bowling show. Oh, it's not the famous Wade in Minnesota. Okay. Go ahead. Hey, uh, you there? Hey, I'm here. Yeah, listen. I want to say about uh, Dusty Rhodes, uh, you know, that people saying you weren't hard enough, you weren't hard enough on them or that, you, you, you know, they didn't want to hear you bring up old controversies. You know, you're supposed to be a journalist, you know what I mean? You should have you should have hit him with everything. Okay. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's it's like it's like if uh Geraldo and and uh was so outspoken against O. J. Simpson for years and then if O. J. did his show, I don't think Geraldo would be asking him uh what was it like to be a spokesperson for uh Hertz rent a car. What's Geraldo um, doing right now, by the way? I don't know what Geraldo's doing. Hmm. Well that other guy, uh that other guy who the cable show. Uh, who used to, be, you know, you, you should have hit him. It was, you know, you're supposed to be a uh, a, a journalist, you know. No, actually, I enjoyed the show with Dusty a lot. Yeah, it was a good show, but he's like public enemy number one in, uh, you know, no, he's not. He's no one. He's no one's, one. He's no one's public enemy number one. Come on, I mean, Dusty. Bad mouth and Dusty. He was a Dusty in the, oh, and so. Dusty was in the 80s and the early 90s. That's that's ancient history. You know what I mean? And then we and brought, then, and we, brought we, we brought stuff up from that period. I mean, what do you want to do? Harp on harp on the fact that he didn't turn Ric Flair babyface in '88? I mean, it's in 2000. Yeah, but then why is it, why does everybody keep bringing that up? And when they write letters in about Dusty and you know and Hogan oh. and all these guys, and then you get them. On I, the I don't. I don't get. Le I haven't gotten letters about Dusty in story. like eight years. I mean, like it's like let's get it's think like it's 2000. I mean, you know, I mean, I, I haven't gotten a letter about Dusty Rhodes' booking, and I couldn't even tell you the last time. And believe me, I get letters. <laughs> About, that, then, that is not a subject that people talk about anymore. I mean, it's day. All these, uh, you guys get all these wrestlers on, and you're just kissing their ass. You know, like Vampiro is like a coilated Dave. You're supposed to be a journalist, not buddy buddy with all these guys. Vampiro. I, 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 I've already said it on the show. I, the Vampiro show was, it was a very different show. What can I say? Yeah. Um, about, about if, if Vince McMahon came out tomorrow and said, "I don't want any kids watching Monday Night Raw," how do you prevent the kids from watching Raw? How do you prevent kids from watching Raw? Vince McMahon came out and said, "I don't want any kids watching Raw. Anybody under the age of..." Oh, but that's that's oh, that, but, oh, that's okay. Now that would be the same as like a tobacco that's company saying. Parents. It's up to the parents right now to do that. So you know what I mean? No, no, no. Okay, wait a minute. It depends on. It's up to you to uh, put on a show for the people who are watching, for the demographics that are watching your show. You can, you know, you can say. Um, I mean, if you can't say you're adult entertainment when some shows, including like Sunday Night Heat, are forty-one percent kids watching. Yeah, I mean, you're, 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 you're fooling you. Those, you know, you're, those, 
I'm talking about Raw. I'm talking about Monday Night Raw. This is still okay. Monday Night Raw, which is Monday Night Raw, which is about 31, 32 percent kids. Yeah, but if this okay. man came out and says, I don't want any kids and he's watching even Raw. And he... What do you do? How do you stop kids from watching Raw? You can't stop kids. Thank the, the whole, the whole, the whole, the whole, the whole, the whole, no, the whole, okay, first of all, the whole point of all this is that you put on a television show for the audience that's watching your show. Yeah, okay. That's the whole key. If the audience watching your show he, he is kids, then you show. should he put on a kid's show. Yeah, you can't, you, you don't make a show that's, um, designed to attract kids. How is Roy designed to attract kids? And the catchphrases, I mean, all uh, oh, catchphrases, signal. come on. Catchphrases now are for kids? Come on. Teenagers, absolutely. Come oh, on. the whole raw marketing is in the team. Oh, come on, come on, come on, come on. You know, you know, you, you, you know what? If you're going on the street and you see a, an adult wrestling fan, mostly you'll see them wearing a T-shirt. If you see a teenage wrestling fan, you'll see him doing a crotch chop. He can't shop stop who watches his show, yet, though. Or Nobody he, knows uh, who watches the show. Okay, first, first of all, first of all, having been okay. How many adults do you see running around going, do you smell what the rock is lot, cooking lot, on the playground? Lot. You don't see it. See ya. Bye, 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 bye. Don't insult my intelligence. Let's go to uh, Chris in Toronto. Hey, Dave. How you doing? That's uh, a new call good. Good there, buddy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, just a, a few things, guy. First of all, how does uh, Mark Madden keep a job? I mean, I don't understand it. How can this guy, he promotes Scott Hall almost more than the guys in the ring are, and he's not that important for the show. He's got the right friends. I mean, you know, Mark, well, Mark Madden's a of Scott Hall, obviously. What, Mark Madden? Mark Madden's a very good friend of Scott Hall. Well, well he's not doing him any favors by doing that. Uh, he, he, I think he, I, I think in his own mind, I think in, the, in their own mind they think they are, but, but deep down you're right, they're not. Don't you think they're using him for a rub? That's what it seems like to me. Um, I think that for to an rub? extent, ev yeah, you know, like the idea is if, if everyone knows... Yeah, so for for pop, everyone everyone knows that to the audience they consider Scott Hall really cool. So if they can be Scott Hall's friends, they can be cool. And the whole key in wrestling is to be cool. So yeah, they are sure they all are. You know, Nash's pages, Mark Madden is all to some extent. Yes. But don't you think you could take out like you could punish like I know it's the way that WCW works. Punish the low guy in the totem pole. Just like they I think they should punish the high guy on the totem pole to send the message. They probably punish the low guy on the totem pole and let the high guy go free. Yeah, then yeah, you have the low guy on the totem pole get punished anyway. That's right. Happen. The high guy in that organization never gets punished. He gets away with murder. You know, it's, oh, it's always the way it's been. It's their policy. They get the, they get the world title or the tag team title. Oh, right. exactly. And a few other things, Dave. I know you talked about the slipping of the business. I don't know what you guys think, but um, I know '97, '98 watching Raw. You'd be at like you know the hour and a half mark, and you think, oh my God, where's the time gone? Now you look at it, and the clock's ten o'clock, and you're thinking, my God, they're still Is an hour over yet. I, 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 you know, I, I, I think I part am of it. I'm guilty of thinking that sometimes. I am, too, I am too, and even sometimes. Well, no, you know what? I, I still think that more during Nitro than Raw. Do you? But at Raw, it's really starting to catch you now. I mean, before it was just quick, and everything's just like, it seems like it's all thrown together now, like Nitro was just a couple of years ago. Like, they put this crap together on, on Monday at 5 o'clock in the afternoon. Well, you know what? It, it's, 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 it's having that, it's the, it's the whole SmackDown effect. It's having to do too much TV in a week. And they probably have enough good ideas for a good two-hour show, but they got four hours to do it in, and they never, every, you know, every, you got to remember, everyone there is overworked. And, oh, it, and it shows. You know, and I mean, and, and, and you know, I think wrestling would be way better off from a creative standpoint if WCW had one TV show a week, you know, one prime time first run show. WWF had the two hour show. Uh, hopefully, it'd be better probably if it were on different nights. Maybe one on a Monday, one on a Tuesday, or one on a Monday and one on a Wednesday. But that's it. Well, I think the business would. No, but it's not going to happen because these TV networks want product, and these guys got to crank it out. And they're still making money on that advertising, and they don't want to cut back and lose that advertising money by eliminating that show. Plus, you know, WF's got those contracts; they, they can't anyway. I mean, they can't. But it would. But I think that as the decline comes, I think it's speeding the decline. Yeah. Well, it's good. They, I mean, the WWF can't stop their shows now. Obviously, they're on. The, they're publicly traded. So I can't no. see them explaining that to their to their shareholders. Oh yeah, like like how we know that. How can you jack we, a show? Yeah, well, you could go in and go. We understand this business, and we know that if we keep running this much free TV in the long run, it's going to hurt our business. So we're going to do this first as a preemptive measure. Um, but it's not—it's never going to happen. I mean, we could, you know, no, no one's ever going to—no one's ever going to say that. Because I know, yeah. One last thought before I let you guys go. 
Um, Dave, you definitely have to check out that interview with Roddy Piper. It's hilarious. I don't know about Brian, but when I saw the part about the cage coming down, I actually had to scroll back up the page and reread it to make sure I got it right. The guy's completely <laughs> delirious, Dave. Don't ever have him on your show. He kayfabe me the whole way through. Uh, <laughs> but you have to check that interview out. It, it's worth. It's just, just worth a laugh to check that out because he, he says crap through that entire four, I think it's a four-part interview that's oh four full pages, and it's just it's a complete page. joke. Is he writing a book? Roddy Piper's writing a book, yeah. Yeah, okay. In fact, I know people who've read parts of his book. And? Um, it was not said to me to be of the caliber of the Dynamite Kids book. Was it total kayfabe? No, it was just Roddy talking like Roddy from what I was told. Because he went through kayfabe and delirious, I thought. Not a, lot, a lot of rambling, yeah. Yeah. Thanks for your time, guys. You. You're very welcome. Uh, let's take a couple. We've got a whole bunch of stuff. On that Death Valley Driver stuff, this is from Mark McGowan. That's the best of the 90s poll list. Uh, I said that the top three matches from all Japan on the list were a number one Misawa versus Kawada, Triple Crown, June 3rd, 1994, which was an unbelievable match. That 1994 was quite the year, wasn't it? Hello? Nobody's... It sure was. Um, I always thought, to me, I don't Mike, I don't know what you were thinking, but um, to me, 94, 95, 96, I really enjoyed those years as a wrestling fan. A yeah, lot. Those were fun, fun, yeah. um, not 94, 95, 96 in Japan in particular. 97 even was good. I think 99, except for WWF, was kind of sad. And then this year, you know, WWF was very good. But right now, I, I you know. Well, I, I think know. we're at that four or five year stretch. You know, wrestling by nature is a very cyclical business, and it seems like it, you know, usually revolves around these five year periods. Where after five years, you know, things will slow down a little bit. Uh, you know, you'll have these major characters and angles like the NWO, uh, Steve Austin, The Rock. And, I mean, let's face it, those, you know, Steve Austin and The Rock, I think we're, we've both seen the apex of their popularity. And, um, you know, you, they can only reinvent themselves uh, so many times. And until another big character like that comes along, you know, I, I think we're at the, the bottom side of that uh, of that swing, though. Okay, the, the second two, number two was Misawa Kobashi versus Kawada Tawe, 1995, June 9, World Tag Team title, which I remember that was a great match. And then third, Kawada Tawe versus Misawa Nakayama, 1996, World Tag League Tournament final. Okay, a lot of those matches were phenomenal. And then this is also is from uh, Kevin Gre or Scott Keith, who says, uh, as a point of interest, the number one match in ECW history on the Death Valley Driver Board is Raven and Stevie Richards against the Pitbulls double dog collar match from 1995. That's the one I voted for as well. I think that one epitomizes the whole ECW attitude, booking strategy, and work ethic from that time period. It's also the only ECW match ever that I would personally consider to be a five-star match. Teresa, what's your thoughts on it? Do you remember that match, or Mike? That specific match? I, I mean, okay. um, I, I remember something about it. I, I know there was a lot of fanfare about that match, but I, I never saw it. Okay. I when I when I had first heard about that match, which was probably the day after the match or maybe even the night of the match, and people were just raving to me about the match. So I saw it on the TV, and I actually was disappointed in the match. Now, from a storyline standpoint, it was absolutely phenomenal the way it was booked with the twists and turns, um, and they broke tons of tables. But I guess where I was disappointed is is that it, you know, no matter how you slice it, you know you still got those four guys and Raven. You know Raven is. Raven is good at what he does, but Raven's not a world-class great technical worker by any means. Okay, but but he's but he's good at what he does. Richards works hard. I mean Gary Wolf, you know he's terrible. And I think the whole thing with that match was is that like you know like the the stuff the guys do with each other isn't really that good. Now the storyline of the match was one of the great greatest storyline matches right. you know you'll ever see with, with the way that all went down. And they broke a lot of tables, but I think with me, I remember there was like one spot where Raven went through a table, and it, and it was like he did it so clumsily, and could have gotten hurt real bad. As it was, he didn't. And to me, like to me, a five star match is when, you know, the stuff is real smooth. Right. I mean, like the work is smooth. No, I mean, I'm not knocking. It, it, it was because the one thing I got to say about it, it was the heat was absolutely out of this world, and to me, the heat made that match. Yeah. You know, but I couldn't. I couldn't rate it as the best match in ECW history because it was, you know, it wasn't a great, uh, well, well, you know, the give and take and, and the actual blows back and forth and, and all that. I mean, that wasn't like world-class level or anything like that. But, I mean, it was great storyline and super heat. So that was my thoughts on that match. So people get mad at me for that maybe. But I don't know, I just, when I saw it on TV, I was going like, 
Oh, you know, I mean, the super heat, but it's not the, you know, yeah, as, as a match itself. Five star match. No. Yeah, I didn't see it as a five star match. Uh, this is from Tim who says, I don't think that anyone these days can throw a credible punch. I was watching some Mid South tapes about two or three weeks ago. I was blown away how good everyone's punches were. I mean, Mike, Mike will, you know, talk about the, the punch kick part of wrestling. The guys who did punch kick and work 300 nights a year doing punch kick wrestling. Uh, their punches and kicks were a lot better than the guys today who do a lot more flying and a lot more spectacular moves. Um, it's just difference at what you practice. Difference oh, yeah. in what you practice. I mean, you, you know, that's one of the things I have watching a lot of the younger guys now is their their punches don't hold up to the punches I remember. But you know, I mean, if I watch just the Hardy Boys throwing those guys out there, yeah. punch punch wise, no, they're not as good as a lot of guys I've seen. But then the other stuff that they do, none of those guys in the past could do. So it's oh, just no. different. I mean, it's a, it's, yeah, it's a whole different ball game now. But you're right, the punches were great. I mean, it was it was some stiff stuff back in those days. Well, even the stuff that wasn't stiff, the way they, the technique of the worked right. punch was, you know, you get like a Dick Murdoch or Bobby Eaton. I mean, oh, I don't, man, yeah. there, there weren't a lot of guys like that who did that punch that made it look like they were tearing your head off and they weren't even hurting you. Yeah, I was talking to Bobby a couple of days ago about his punch, and he said he, he never thought it was anything special, but I mean, well, it, was. it certainly was. Yeah. Uh, let's see, this goes this is from Tyler in Colorado who goes, whatever happened to Greg Gagne? I mean, I know he's living in Minnesota. Do you know what he's doing? Is he selling cars? Um, you know, I think I did hear something about him selling cars, yeah, back in Minnesota. I don't that know if he's still doing it or not. And he says, my favorite match of all time was Undertaker, Shawn Michaels, Hell in a Cell. That was a good one. Uh, yeah, that, I, I can never give you a fair, uh, whatever it is on that match. Although I did see, when I saw it live, I was in total haze. And I watched it with some friends like the Friday after, like five days later when I was in a lot better shape. And we pretty much all thought it was like one of the greatest matches we'd ever seen. And then he goes, my second favorite was Eddie Guerrero, Rey Mysterio from Halloween Havoc 97. You know, that was, that was uh, to me, that was the number one uh, WCW match of the decade. Yeah. Okay. And he goes, winners, Taz and Raven going to get a push. Uh, to the top, maybe, maybe never. Uh, higher, who knows. And he goes, Chris Jericho, in my opinion, has the most upside for the future. We've got a full bank of calls to get to, so let's get through everyone as quick as we can. Matt, you're up first. Hi, how are you guys doing today? Very good. Well, that's good. Um, do you guys still think that there's steroid use in the Dodo F? Of course there is. <laughs> yeah, but who, who, is Triple H doing it? What? Is Triple H doing it? Steroid. I don't. I don't. I don't want to discuss any. I think that everyone can tell pretty much. I don't want to single anyone out because the point is, it's probably seventy percent of the guys, so it's unfair to single. Anyone personally out? I think everyone knows, you know, like pretty much for sure on a lot of the guys. But yeah, I mean, I don't, you know, do you think that's how they get their push? Is like, okay, if I take some steroids, then McMahon will give me a push. Uh, there I is. I get bigger. McMahon. Yeah, bigger. Push. Yeah, I, I think that there's. I think there's certainly the mentality that the bigger and more muscular and the better your body looks, the more you will be pushed. And that encourages steroid use, not just in the WWF, but in wrestling in general. And when you see Scott Steiner or Triple H or Bill Goldberg getting these big pushes because they have that physical look, it only encourages it. If, if guys like, if, if a guy looked like Scott Steiner and he was stuck in the opening match because he didn't work as good as the Scott Steiner of 10 years ago, um, then maybe people wouldn't be so encouraged to use steroids. But the fact is that Scott Steiner isn't one-fourth the worker he was um, in his younger days, and now he's world champion, and he wasn't even considered for that spot eight, ten years Four ago. Four times as big, but and he's much, you know, and, he, and, he, and he's probably yeah, he's probably forty pounds heavier than he was then. And like he used Donald to be and all those guys. They're probably telling the younger guys that if you take the stuff, that you'll probably get a bigger push in the future, right? I don't think Hunter's uh, telling anybody how to get a bigger push. No, but <laughs> 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 the guys WCW. Like, um, I mean, you know, the power plant, that's what they turn out. I mean, I think that's one of the problems with the power plant is that the, the, if you look at most of the guys they turn out, and I know there's going to be exceptions, but most of them are Sean O'Hare, Chuck Palumbo, Mark Jindrick. You've got these guys. They're all these Mike six Sanders. foot five, six foot. Well, Mike Sanders is no, not, no, isn't no, that, that buff. But, but you've got these six foot five, six foot six muscular guys, you know, and, and the problem is, is that those guys are good. On, I, it's a really weird psychology. Those guys are good on top, but they're terrible on the bottom of a card. Because on t on, like a real freaky big physical specimen is kind of cool as a main eventer, 
that they're really crummy as a preliminary match guy because they don't really provide that much action, even though I will say that Sean O'Hare and Mark Jindrick are very, very agile. Um, but, they're, but they're so big that it's hard for the smaller guys to work with them without it looking stupid. Um, do you guys think that uh, Mick Foley is going to get back in the ring with McMahon because they had a big fight on uh, SmackDown? Yeah, I think they're going to do it at WrestleMania. That's what and I think. Is, okay, and about this one, um, New Blood Rising, you know when they had the New Blood versus the uh, Millionaire's Club? Why didn't they put the New Blood as the baby face and the Millionaire's Club as the heels? <laughs> I never understood that. <laughs> Nobody did. <laughs> beyond me. I, I, know, I, I answer asking that question. <laughs> <laughs> well, so there's no reason to that, or, or uh, do you want to be it's, a baby face? It's Vince Russo. All I can say is it's Vince Russo, and you know, I mean, I, I think Vince Russo's track record speaks for itself. But if you had talent like that 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 they had at that time, and you put them in the babyface role, and you give them the push, they probably would have done something. I think the idea that, that to Russo's credit, or no, um, I think his idea was he thought that because The Rock and Steve Austin had gotten over so good as heels and had become phenomenal baby faces, that the way to build baby faces for the future was to make them heels. The only problem is is that like you know Hulk Hogan, Billy Kidman, just as an example, from a psychology standpoint, from every standpoint, they were so messed up with Hulk Hogan as the baby face in that feud that that feud just was I mean to me an absolute disaster for both guys. And, um, you know the XFL tickets in Birmingham, is it true that they can't sell out for Armageddon this Sunday, so they're just giving tickets away for free, or, or are they going to sell it out? I haven't heard the advance for Armageddon. Let me check on that. But I do know, I, I, when I heard that story of what they were doing, I got the impression that what they were doing was trying to encourage people to buy the football tickets that weren't selling and, not, and use the wrestling Getting the ability to get a wrestling ticket is the leverage to sell football tickets rather than rather than the other way around. Yeah. But I could be wrong. But that was that was what I when I heard that like if you buy a season ticket you can get a free ticket to Armageddon. I didn't think that it was that Armageddon wasn't selling well. I thought it was that the Birmingham um, whatever that team is wasn't wasn't right. selling yeah, well. I think you're right. Um, were you surprised that Vince McMahon did nothing for the ratings? Yes, very much so. Oh, okay. Thanks, guys. Bye. Okay, you're very welcome. Okay, let's go to Sean in PA. Sean, what's up? Hello. Hey, how are you? Hey, guys, how's it going? Um, two, two quick things. Um, if you were going to book uh, the, the WWF pay-per-view coming up, who would you put over in the Hell in a Cell? Angle. Or, or, would you, <laughs> <laughs> or would you hold it up so there, it can be the, so the winner of the Rumble will get the title? Nope. They may, they may do that. Brian, Brian says Angle. I say... Rock. I right, say you Rock. Put it back on Rock? But yeah, because I want I want Rock to the title against Austin at WrestleMania, and I want Rock established as champion before the match. So yeah, I say Rock. So Austin will probably win the Rumble again. <laughs> um, yeah, I'll see. Uh, if Rock oh, if Rock gets the title, Austin should win the Rumble. Yeah, I don't know though. But, well, if he comes in late, it's okay. Yeah. okay. I just don't. You know, it doesn't really matter though because I don't think. I can't even remember who won the Rumble. Like, the last couple of years, Vince won the Rumble. He didn't end up in the uh, WrestleMania main event. Well, last year, Ro last year Rock did, sort of, although he had to beat the big show again. Yeah, so it doesn't really matter, I don't think, who wins the Rumble anymore. And another point I wanted to bring up, I was watching the, uh, the Lita Malenko match on Raw Monday night, and, man, when, she, when uh, Lita gave uh, Malenko that moonsault, I was so worried Lita was going to win. And uh, I'm so Sick of the WWF protecting these women, especially seeing China fight and throw these punches. Yeah. I, I just want someone like Ben Watt to just go off and just knock <laughs> her out because this is so silly. You know, I, I'm all about you know, the of belief and everything, but man, if, if I was in a ring with China or Lita, I, I'd kick their ass. <laughs> it's just not even funny. It does yeah, maybe not China, but maybe. Yeah. No, you know the thing with, with um, if, if, if one of those guys did that to China, it would be really weird because. The girls would be in horror because she's like a hero to them. Right. And the guys would. L I think that there's a whole group of guys that really <laughs> want to see that really bad right now. Because I think a lot of guys are are, are kind of sick of China. But China's like a big cele big time celebrity, and they got to protect their celebrities. Yeah. yeah, but still, I mean, you know, they're they're cutting it with Hunter playing God and falling from that, you know, falling from 40 feet or whatever they said it was. I mean, I think there's a way that they could book China where it would be completely ridiculous. But it's like a match that. You can't do every single week. I mean, she's on TV every yeah, single week. Yeah, she is. They have been, you're right. Somebody. They've been overdoing that. And, I mean, and the first thing to do is don't ever let her punch or kick because that's <laughs> horrible. And I'm sure there's a way that you could put a match together with China that would not be horrible, but you can't do it every single week. 
Yeah, and you'd have to, and also you won't, you want to do it with some mid card people because I used to hate like the Jericho China feud. I just thought it was just like stupid. I mean, if really we did once for every three did. months, a guy like Malenko had a match like she did with him, I would have no problem. It'd be awesome. Instead, they have to expose her every week doing these horrendous punches and. Uh, Lita, Lita, I mean, to me, you know, you're right, though. Lita's at her best in the Hardy's corner doing the one Hurricane Rana move out of nowhere, which is such a spectacular move on a guy. That's okay, but to go in there, you know, like, to do a whole match, I mean, that's got to be sparing. They can't. Be, they shouldn't be doing that one, like, Especially week after week. Especially with somebody that, that can't hide your weaknesses, like well, with well, the other women or, you know. Right, but even, yeah. even, a, even a Lita, Molly Holly match wouldn't be too bad. Well, Mo Molly Holly can work a little bit, so yeah, yeah. that's okay. That's okay. Uh, Molly Holly got a miracle match out of Tristratus, oh, yeah. whatever, whenever that's that good. match was. I don't know if it's going to happen again this week, but I didn't hear that it was, uh, was again. I'm really scared of that three-way though on on the pay-per-view because, you know, I Ivory's got some experience, but she isn't very good. Molly Holly is, you know, pretty decent, and Trish is still, you know, so Trish, you know, to work a three-way, Trish is so inexperienced. And you know, Stephanie is doing a lot of the writing now, and um, I think yeah. she's got. Uh, particular control over the, the women's program, so, you know, that could explain some of it, I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Uh, also, one more thing, why why are Jericho, and even Benoit at that point, I, I, I still can't believe Benoit's not in the hell in the cell, because if they're going to put six guys in it, I know they got even out the teams, but um, they, they could have, you know, go ahead and made it eight instead of having Jericho fight Canigan and having uh, Benoit fight Billy Gunn, that just seems like such a waste. Well, I think that they actually have reasons for those two matches. I think that this is Jericho's chance to finally beat Kane. And then also, with Benoit and Billy Gunn, I mean, I think that there's a long-term plan, um, which probably will change, but there's a long-term plan of making Benoit like the Intercontinental Champion for a long period of time just to, just, just to do that and, 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 and give him a whole bunch of wins in a row. So I think that, you know, that's what this is all about. Yeah, because Jericho almost has to go over. Plus, if they're going to put, like, uh, Ben Juan in that cage, he'd have to replace somebody because six guys stuck in that cage is going to be hard enough. I can't even imagine eight. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, the thing with, with, with Ben Juan is that nobody, nobody, would, nobody would miss Ben Juan replacing Rikishi in that match. But, you know, at the same time, it's like maybe if we're lucky, you know, that Ben Juan, Billy Gunn, ah, boy, it's a tough pay-per-view, isn't it? When I start looking at that lineup, this is a tough pay-per-view. Yeah, it is. Yeah, I, I, I'm I'm not buying it. I know that much because there's there's nothing I want to see. There's no you know there's there's no ladder match that I want to see. There's no there's there's just nothing that really captures my interest. I might as well just you know read the recaps at eleven o'clock on the internet. I just don't think yeah. those three way, four way, six main way matches are as you know as effective as a, just a, you know special singles match at the end. Um, well, I I don't think that they're as effective as one on wanting to make me buy the match because there's no focus on it. Yeah, right. You know, there's no focus on a specific issue. It's just a whole bunch of guys yeah. thrown together. I mean, for for the idea of, of one Royal Rumble once a year, I think is great. And and doing maybe a three way every now and then. You know, the the thing with a three way is, as a novelty, I, I mean, it's kind of good. But but generally speaking, they're not as good matches as your straight singles. Oh, uh -uh. So and then when you start doing four ways and six ways, it's just so much. Yeah. All right, guys, that's about it. Appreciate it. See you. Okay, very welcome. Okay, uh, is it Adam next? Um, real quick, because I know you're short on time. Um, how do you think if they bring Shawn Michaels back for Mania, like they're saying they might? How do you think they'll bring him back? Uh, God, angle-wise, I think the, I think the part put him with, with if they go with Rock and and um, Austin on top, I would think that Shawn will end up with doing something with Triple H where they'll get together and then Triple H will double cross him like he's double crossing everyone else. And, and then they'll do the ma guest referee or something and screw something up or uh, maybe on the January thing. The thing is, is that if Sean's guest referee though, everyone will kind of know that. Man, so so yeah, even if people know, so what? Just yeah. some of the best angles people knew ahead of time. Yeah, but um, like five percent of us actually know. <laughs> yeah, the um, but yeah, I mean, I think that it would be good to have Sean against Hunter. For the other reason, I would say that I mean. Because you really, I think everybody really wants Sean to have a great, great match. Because if he has anything less than a great match, it's kind of like, wow, we saw him in all those great matches and this wasn't one. And he's probably only going to have one. And Hunter, you know, both from stylistic, the fact they're friends, and the fact that Hunter's a hell of a worker. That's except for Benoit, that's probably your best bet. And and I would rather see Sean against Hunter in a farewell match because of you know their history than Sean against Benoit. Yeah. Me, even even though the Benoit match might even be a better match. 
Foley mentioned it on the East side. That's what brought it to the front of my mind. You know. Oh, wait, Sean and Hunter or just Sean Wrestling? No, yeah, um, someone asked him, they had this little interview column on E, and someone asked him, one of the questions was, what have you heard about Shawn Michaels coming back to the ring? He's like, well, from what I hear, Shawn really wants to do it, so on and so forth, this, that, and the other. Yeah, well, I mean, I think it's pretty clear that he wants to do what he said. He said that he is coming back for a match, and if he's going to do it, it might as well be WrestleMania in Houston. You know, it's the it's the time and the place if you're going to do one match. You know, you might as well do it on, on you know, what what could be the biggest show of the year and maybe even of all time, if you, they're lucky. You think that massive ego could handle only semi-main eventing, though? He's going to have to. Ah. He ain't coming back in the main... He's not coming back, you know, unless they do a four-way main event, and that's not a good idea for this year. Yeah. This year, they've got the main event. Rock and Austin with nobody else around. That's, that's the match. They yeah, shouldn't, that sold their 66,000 tickets. Yeah. They shouldn't... They don't need to mess with it because it's there. We should do the betting line on whether or not Hunter's going to end up in there. Mm, I would bet. I will bet that he will, but they shouldn't do it. <laughs> you know what? No, I mean if you're going to bet, if I'm going to bet, I did last year. I'm going to be furious. Yeah, that four way. That wasn't even that. That wasn't even any good. Oh, I didn't think. Sucked. Yeah. I remember. I, didn't, yeah, I remember driving I didn't even like that, that show and being angry. I remember that thing. It was like WWF had never been hotter, and then they did that WrestleMania. And they had come off those two great pay-per-views in January and February. The bowling one. And I just think, and then they, this WrestleMania is not even close. And they come back in April and have, you know, the, four weeks later and have a show that was like probably like, maybe that backlash may have been the best one of the whole year. Mm -hmm. I was like, you know, day. But, you know, that was good too. But, I mean, it's like that mania, God, with all that hype in it, it wasn't even close. Sucked ass, plain and simple. Yeah. Thanks, Mike. I like your column. Thank you very day. much. Thanks. Okay. Any, are there any other callers or should we... Okay, Charles. What's happening, Charles? Hey, Dave. How you doing, Dave and Brian and everybody? Hey. I just wanted to say briefly because I know you guys are pretty much out of time. Um, I hear the other callers calling in, and they keep criticizing you for being too soft on Dusty. And it's only, I, it's, I, only I one, it's only one. It's only one. It's only one caller. Okay. He just comes under other un, under many different names. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, because <laughs> I, I I don't know. To me, the guy <laughs> Wade in Minnesota. Like, that was a good one. He sounds like a confrontation junkie, though. I mean, from the same standpoint that you don't do a kayfabe show, I think it would be just as ridiculous to invite guys on just to fight with them the whole Very show. Up. I mean, that's well, then nobody would come on. But and that's not you know, and that's not even the issue anyway. The issue is, is that I, I, you know, people wanted Dusty Rhodes on. We, you know, we brought up some of the things from '87 and '88, you know, and, and talked about them. But I'm not going to go in there and go, you know, you're an idiot because he's not an idiot. You know what I mean? And every, everything, <laughs> you know what, Dave? Everything was pretty much, for the most part, asked and answered. People, Dusty knows how you feel about certain things. You know how Dusty feels. Dusty. Well, we've talked. We, he, he and I have talked. He and I have talked about all this stuff. You know, it's, you know, you know, it's like, you know, we both know. And I mean, you know, you, you, you. Uh, I mean, he's not Satan, and no one, no one's Satan. Thank I mean, you know. We joke about Hunter, but my God, he's like you know one of the two or three best workers in the business in this yeah, country. Like anyway, on the, on the show to embarrass him either, you know. I mean, that's not the purpose. I mean, yeah, that's, no. it, it just yeah. doesn't make sense. You know, I think well, some people they just can't. I guess they can't. The, the lines between reality and entertainment are blurred, and they just want to see confrontation both on TV and you I know, think on that guy shows just wants to and cause confrontation on really... the show between the host and him. And, yeah. you know, I, didn't, I didn't hear the show, but I bet you Dusty even openly talked about his Dusty finish. I mean, you know, yep. sure. He well, we, we just got to it right at the end. Yeah, yeah okay. He didn't know what it was, yeah. though. I mean, it's not like <laughs> 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 yeah, we, we, were, we were actually joking about it all the way till the end, and then we brought it up. And he kind of, like, kind of like wanted to hint that, like, a lot of the times that that finish came, that it was the guys booking it themselves. I don't know about that one. <laughs> After that, you know, Dave, I think it's great journalism to give your honest opinion and then let the guy come on and say how he feels about it. I mean, you well, know, you get both, you. both point of views and you make your own decision. Well, thanks. But that, that's all I had to say about that. I, I, I just kind of, I, I try to respect everybody's opinion uh, as much as I can, but I, for some reason those calls kind of irritate me. Because it, okay. the criticism is just is, is not founded in, in any any logic or reason to me. Okay. Well, I mean, I I got no problems with the Dusty show. In fact, I it was it was really a fun show to do, and hopefully we'll do it again. Um, the Vamp show was a different was a different breed, but you know it was, it was fun, and I actually got more compliments on the Vamp show than any show in the last few weeks. But that's neither here nor there. Yeah, I, I have to go back and listen to that one. I, I didn't hear the Vamp show, but I heard it, it was controversial. We got to ask Dusty next time he's on. We got to ask about that spot, though. We didn't. Oh my God. 
Yeah. Well, the first, he, oh, first time I saw it was years ago in the 70s. It, it was either Pac Song or, uh, or uh, what's his name? Uh, what's the guy? Uh, oh, God. Uh, the German Pac guy. Song? Um, what, I didn't even know you were thinking did, of. They did a claw and they bladed. The Wal- Waldo Von Erich? No, uh, not for, Waldo uh, Von, uh, Von Raschke? Uh, Von Raschke? Yeah, Von Raschke. It was yeah. one of those two, and they did the angle where, you know, Dusty kind of, they bladed the stomach and they put the claw on the stomach, and that's the first time I noticed it. I don't know if that's where it came from or not. No, 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 no. I think, I think, I think it was, I think it was one with it. Charles, we're totally out of time. Mike, I want to thank you very much for doing the show, and we'll thanks for having have me you on. back on. Thanks oh, you're very welcome. Okay, and Brian and uh, Mike, thanks for helping out, and we'll be back tomorrow with the Sinister Minister.